Hello, I'm Rick Lake, co-founder and co-chairman of Lake Partners. Today, I'm here with Phil DeSantis, CFA, and Harvey Steele from Westwood Holdings Group. Their firm has just launched a new sensible fees model. Today, I wanted to go in-depth and understand what they're up to, since fees and pricing seem to be perennial topics and a sensitive topic in the financial services industry. Phil, welcome. Rick, thanks for having us today. And Harvey? Great to be here, Rick. So I just read about your program, which Westwood calls revolutionary, and I understand is intended to disrupt the asset management industry. So that's a very bold headline. Tell me more about what's underway at Westwood. Well, thanks, Rick. It's a bold headline, and we think it's sensible fees is a bolder solution to solving a big problem investors face today, and that's higher fixed fee structures and efficient asset classes like U.S. large cap. What a lot of investors don't realize is if you look over the last 10 years, only 22% of mutual fund investors in the U.S. large cap segment have outperformed their benchmark. What that translates to is over $100 billion. It's a staggering number have gone from investors' pockets to underperforming active managers. So what we've done with Sensible Fees is we've created at Westwood a very simple and innovative fee solution that's designed to do three things. And that's one, solve the fee problem. Two, change the probability of winning for active investors. And three, level the playing field, particularly at a time when the market environment going forward, we believe will be very different than it has been over the last 10 years. So let's get down to basics. What exactly are sensible fees? So sensible fees are offered in two fee structures. One is what we call sensible zero base fee. And this is very straightforward. The base fee is a flat zero. So this is a very efficient way for investors to get their indexing or their beta for zero. And you only pay when we outperform. So if we underperform our benchmark, you pay zero. When we outperform a benchmark, the client always retains the asymmetric advantage and retains 60 to 80% of the upside. The second fee structure is what we call sensible IR-based fees. And IR-based fees are really predicated upon what's called information ratio. Information ratio has been used by academics and industry experts for a long time to measure not only the outperformance of an active manager, but how much active risk or tracking risk a manager is taking to generate that performance. So what we've done is we've converted IR to a fee, and we combine that with a zero or a low base fee to align our compensation with not only the level of outperformance, but the level of risk management as well, and we're quantifying that. So there are two varieties of sensible fees. Correct. There's two varieties, and they're really predicated upon giving the investor the asymmetric advantage. They overcome traditional fulcrum fees, where the the base fee is either a low zero or low ETF-like base fee. And we're using risk-based performance to calculate our fees. That's the big differentiator with sensible fees. So it starts at zero or minimal fees, and then adds on an additional compensation if the manager delivers value add. Correct. It's a zero or low ETF-like fee. Plus, and we combine that with a performance fee where you only pay if we outperform on a risk-adjusted basis. Okay. So that puts the manager's feet to the fire. It does. And it also aligns interests. I think one of the largest challenges in the financial services industry today is really aligning client interest with the interests of the asset manager. And if you think about establishing trust and reinforcing that relationship, you really have to be on the same page. And I think largely over the last few years, the market has spoken. Beta is valued fairly low. Depending on the category, you're looking at a couple basis points. Clients have proven that they're not willing to pay for beta. What they are willing to pay for is management skill and getting them returns above their expectations without taking excess risk. So we've gone back to the market and tried to address that directly. So how does an advisor put this to work for their clients? So today, we would be doing this in a separately managed account, direct with financial advisors out there in the marketplace. And I think you're really going to see them source this from a couple places. 
you know, if you look at the last 10 years in the equity market, we've had mid-teens returns with relatively low volatility. Because of that, it's very easy to understand why so many folks have gone passive. There's really been no real cost of going passive. You haven't needed to be much different than the market to do well. Moving forward, capital markets expectations are significantly different depending on who you listen to, Vanguard, Schwab, things along those lines. Starting to look at maybe a 5% handle on the S&P the next decade. Once you start to think about layering fees on top of that, a blended portfolio that isn't all equities, you're looking at a return profile for a client that's potentially in the threes. If you look at passive, the real cost of passive is you don't have a goal. You're not different than the market. It's very hard to differentiate yourself. So this gives the advisor an opportunity to go back to a client, try something different, invest in a portfolio with a strategy to out-earn market returns in exchange for fees. So it really changes the conversation and it gives them a chance to come back to an asset class that they're desperately going to need alpha in moving forward if you're going to meet your capital markets expectations for clients. So will this alter the asset allocation decision? I think it will. Of shifting active versus passive? I, I absolutely think it will. You know, if you talk to financial advisors across America today, you know, many of them came up in the industry believing very strongly in active management. The challenge is getting a client to stay the course in a vertical beta market when you have a high fee drag. We're taking that high fee drag away. And what's interesting is if you think about the average active manager in the value space, they have not delivered any alpha. If you take our base fee, we charge you zero for that. So we're actually cheaper than the ETF, which allows the client to look for the opportunities to go active. And there's not a price penalty to do that. And I think that demographic, that, that change is very meaningful for financial advisors when they're making an allocation decision. So if the allocation decision will be evolving from passive versus active in leading to passive versus sensible fees, what are the ranges of allocation mix that you might see as an investor builds a portfolio with these different fee structures that are now available? You know, I think it's all over the place. I think it's going to depend a lot on the investor's goal. If you look at indices today, the majority of these indices are cap-weighted. If you think about cap weighting the S&P 500, for example, and, and you start to look at you know, dividend payers, if you have a goal-based portfolio, you may be equal weighted or you might be almost inversely cap weighted. Some of the largest companies out there don't pay much in the way of dividends. So if you think about really being able to go back to an investor goal, I think that's going to dictate your allocation. But this just gives you another tool to kind of go about that. I think, Rick, another good point is, in addition to altering the way that an advisor or an institution would think about asset allocation, it really should alter the way that investors think about manager allocation. So if you, if you have two managers together and you combine our sensible fee approach with our large cap select product, and you're looking at another value manager that's charging 70 or 80 basis points, or, or if you look at the average, 1.04%. If you're thinking about aligning those two products and making a better asset allocation decision, when you think about manager skill, taking a sensible fee approach with Westwood allows you to really eliminate paying a high fixed fee. You would only pay an active fee if we outperform our benchmark. Our goal with that is to, again, solve the fee problem and change the probability of winning for active investors in an efficient asset class where the consistencies of return have been challenging largely due to fee structures, net of fee. So will this enable investors to more readily implement active strategies if it's on an equal footing with passive or ETFs? We think it allows investors to take, rethink their approach in the active space, particularly in one of the most important asset classes and one of the largest asset classes in their portfolios, which is US large cap. If you're thinking about, as Harvey had mentioned, market returns are going to be less going forward. Advisors, institutions, consultants need to work harder to generate higher returns going forward. How do they do that? All else equal, if they can do that with a sensible fee structure, that really changes the math for investors. So let's talk about the basics. What was the rationale in the sensible fees model to use risk-based fees? That, that's a great question, Rick. There were really two points that we wanted to solve for. One is we wanted to align our fees with what we would consider the true value of active management. So with zero base fees, we wanted to look at, we wanted to use alpha as the term for measurement versus excess returns. And what that allows us to do is we would 
um, basically have built-in guardrails for investors that would deter an asset manager from taking unnecessary or uncompensated excess risk that really wasn't skill-based. So the manager's not paid for excess risk. The manager's only paid for providing additional alpha. It's really, for zero-based fees, it's around alpha and the true value of active management. So it really deters an active manager or us at Westwood from taking additional market risk that's not skill-based and aligning our fees with something that's not considered alpha. Okay, let's also go into the mechanics of the IR or information ratio fee structure. Explain that. So information ratio is excess return divided by active risk, or what we call tracking error risk. So we're trying to align our fees with not only the outperformance relative to the benchmark, but how much risk we're taking, how much tracking risk the manager is taking relative to the benchmark. So that's really taking scrutiny to the highest level, both in terms of outperformance and limiting excess risk relative to the benchmark to align our fees. So the more active risk that we would take, for example, versus the benchmark, if we're not generating excess return, our fees are actually going to be going to be lower. Well, this sounds very different from the historical phenomenon of fulcrum fees. Explain the difference between fulcrum fees and your sensible fee structure. Sure. The biggest challenge with fulcrum fees, there's really two of them. One, the criticism in the marketplace is that, one, the base fees have been too high. So we've seen fulcrum fees that have base fees of, for example, 45 basis points from one of our competitors. Our base fee with sensible fees is either a zero or a low ETF-like fee. But the biggest criticism with fulcrum fees is really around how they measure performance fees. And typically, fulcrum fees will just use excess returns. And excess returns can be gamed by a manager by just taking simply more market risk, potentially at the expense of the investor, if they get that call wrong. And it's not really skill-based. With sensible fees, we wanted to use risk-based performance fees to measure how, how we measure performance fees in order to align our fees with not only performance, but with risk management. And a lot of managers talk about risk management. We're actually quantifying risk management and holding our feet to the fire and taking scrutiny to a whole nother level. So your scrutiny is not just for excess returns, but it's excess returns per unit of risk or the risk taken. That is correct. So that's the critical evolutionary difference here. We think that's the evolutionary difference, particularly for investors that spend a lot of time thinking about their risk budget and how much active risk they're taking relative to the index. And what we're doing is we're aligning our fees with our clients and how they think about that. What was the original inspiration to create sensible fees? Well, we really wanted to align with the client and align our interests. So going back to your previous question about excess return versus risk-adjusted returns, if you think about really the prevalence of fees and, and the fee discussion that came up about 15 years ago and the, the move to ETFs, another thing happened at the same time. You saw performance fees change dramatically in the hedge fund world, in the alternatives world. And you look at the tail end of the last economic cycle, and I know we're in a much different position today, but you really had folks get paid an awful lot of money to really swing for the fences at the tail end of an economic cycle. And you look at 2005, 2006, 2007, which was probably the worst time in history to be adding risk to portfolios. You were able to print massive returns and get huge performance bonuses in each of those sequential years to do so. And then in subsequent years, some of these shops went out of business. And I think we wanted to turn that on its head and make sure that we could never do that to a client and get paid. And so I think that was the genesis where we started to look at this. And then we started to go down the spectrum and say, what do we really have to do to win an active management? One, you have to have active share. You have to be different than a benchmark. You have to have a portfolio intent to win. And then you have to make sure that you give the asymmetric advantage to a client so that no matter what, as an asset manager, as the fiduciary, you have to act in their best interest and make sure you're looking out for them. So I think that was the genesis of where we started our research. That's a great point, Harvey. I mean, he mentions asymmetric advantage, and, and that really was the thesis. If you think about the historical model for active management, an investor would pay a high fixed fee and hope and pray the manager performed. What we want to do is completely turn that model on its head, particularly in an efficient asset class like U.S. large cap where if we do our jobs, we get paid, essentially. And that's a dramatic change 
not only for how an asset manager will face the client, but it changes the math. And our goal is to change the probability of winning for active investors. So this is interesting in terms of the role of this development with Westwood. What inspired Westwood to do this after 35 years as, a, as an active manager? Well, it's a good question. One, it's humility. And, and take a look at the industry today. Indexing in ETFs is a $10 trillion business today. In aggregate, the active management industry is failing. And it's really failed to innovate for investors. And what we're doing at Westwood is we're evolving our business, we're innovating within our business, and we're really uniquely positioned to do this for a couple different reasons. One, when you look at the two most important corollaries to outperforming in an efficient asset class, one, it's active share, and two, it's fee structure. Westwood for 35 years has been a high conviction, high active share manager. For example, in our, in our large cap select product, which is our, our first offer in this space, it's our best ideas portfolio with 25 names in the portfolio, roughly 25 names in the portfolio. When we combine that portfolio, which is different than the market, behaves differently from the market, and is a true active portfolio with a sensible fee structure, we believe we can change the probability of winning for active investors. So we're uniquely positioned to do this relative to many players in the industry, which we think, quite honestly, we think would be quite painful for. So does this new fee structure work best for concentrated, high conviction, high active share managers? Absolutely. You know, I think if you look at the large cap asset class in general, Phil mentioned some of the numbers earlier, the majority of managers do not outperform. And it makes sense. If you're not much different than the index, you have 100 or so securities. It's very, very difficult and arduous to outperform, and most managers don't. If you think about our portfolio, if we offered zero alpha, we would be printing zero fees. Most managers can't do this. The only way to do that is to be materially different than your benchmark. So this type of fee approach is custom made for active strategies? Absolutely. Understood. So fee compression has been an issue for a while. What else do you see happening in the industry? There's a couple of things. Obviously, the move to passive is a big part of not only fee structures, but the challenges that active managers have had. We see a sustainable investing being a bigger and bigger trend in the industry. And I think bigger picture is just fintech. Technology is playing a major role in reshaping not only how asset managers face investors today, but how they invest and how they can how investors can interact with their money day to day. So we see fintech playing a major role, not only today, but a much bigger role the next five or 10 years. So fintech might be able to enhance the ease of access to your fee structure and your strategies. So Rick, I think the largest role technology has played is really the increase in transparency into investment styles and investment processes, not only for professional buyers, whether you're an institution, a financial advisor, an RIA, but also the end client. So I think a lot of things that kind of went by in the industry over the last decade or so aren't going by today. And you've seen that in investment preference. So if you were a closet indexer a decade ago, it's pretty hard to pull that out. Today, you can log on to a public site and figure that out in a few minutes. So I think for financial advisors, you really have to be able to go to your client with a value add. I think some of the trends that we've seen, particularly as they deal with ETFs over the last couple of years, have been a difficult transition for advisors because you have a very large section of your book and an index has no intent. Clients have intent. They have goals. They have funding goals. They need to pay for their kids' college. They have to fund their own retirement. So I think the financial advisors are going to need to make a transition back to invest in portfolios with intent, with the intent to hit a client goal. You know, another thing that I've seen coming up here the last few months specifically, as we've had a flattening yield curve, as we've had the equity market slow down, is you're starting to see really intense competition from other industries going after advised assets on advisors' books. And it makes sense. You start to think about a return profile that's less than it has been. You layer on fees. There's other things you can do with that money if you're just going to be an index investor. I mean, CDs today can pay 3%. Fixed annuities can pay 4%. You can buy a municipal bond at 3.5% tax-free. So I think folks are really going to have to pivot back to goals-based portfolios with direct intent to do something that a client's looking to, to solve. And you need active share to do that. You need to be competitive on pricing, and you have to be creative. And I think that's what sensible fees do. So those, those could be wise words for investors in the future. An index has no intent 
but an individual has a goal. Absolutely. And that's a critical thing to remember as we enter this transition zone for the markets. Well, and I think that's incredibly important as you're aligning incentives. You know, you really only have a few types of fee structures in the market. For efficient asset classes, it's been predominantly fixed fees. The intent of an investor is to get exposure to the broad market and hopefully outperform. The intent for the manager, of course, would like to outperform, but if you have a very large basket of securities that you're charging a fixed fee on, you want the basket to grow, right? Then you look at performance fees, which traditionally have been compensated on excess return. Again, client hopes you have excess return, but they want you to be careful on the risk budget, but you're not really incented to do that because of fees. And let's be honest, markets go up most years. We've really tried to marry all the incentives to make sure that we're on the same page with the advisor and then give them the asymmetric return profile to where they're always going to be the winner. Another thing that I think speaks a lot to the company and one of the reasons I joined is the company really takes its duties as a fiduciary very seriously. We've actually capped our fees at 1.25%, which in a performance fee world is unheard of. That's a fraction of what you would look at with other vendors. So Phil, why did Westwood start with large cap? Does the sensible fee structure work for all asset classes, all capitalizations, all styles? It's a great question. One, it's important to understand that all asset classes are not created equal. And what we mean by that is when you look at the U.S. large cap asset class, which is one of the most efficient asset classes in the entire universe, investors are at a statistical disadvantage. For example, over the last 10 years, as I mentioned prior, only 22% of mutual fund investors in the the U.S. large cap asset class have outperformed. And when they do outperform, the average level of outperformance is only 1.25% of the benchmark. That's drastically different, for example, when you look at U.S. small cap, where 70% of managers outperform and the margin of outperformance is closer to 2% over the benchmark. So what we wanted to do with sensible fees is take a high conviction, high active share portfolio and combine it with a sensible fee approach to change the probability of winning for investors in one of the most important, one of the most efficient asset classes, which is U.S. large cap, and give the client an asymmetric advantage compared to where they're at today with a higher fee fix structure, where we believe they have a statistical disadvantage. And Harvey, what does Westwood mean by asymmetric advantage? Oh, absolutely. That's a great question, Rick. Let me give you an example, I think, that probably best serves our case here. If you're a traditional fixed fee manager in the active space, you're charging an average fee of 1.04%, no matter what happens in the market or what your portfolio management team does in terms of performance. So you're winning no matter what. From a client standpoint, you're entering into that agreement knowing full well that three quarters of managers do not outperform. And when they do, it's by a thin margin. So the client's taking a chance, paying a high fixed fee for a low chance of really significant outperformance. So the aces are really in the hands of the folks managing the money. With us, we've completely turned that around. Unless we outperform, you pay zero. And if we do outperform, you still get the lion's share of the outperformance. And we've even capped our participation in that at 1.25%. So it's really a very different scenario that we believe has never been done before for investors. What's your vision for Westwood's sensible fees in the future? When we think about fee structures for active investors, one, we want to change the math. How do we help investors win in a more difficult environment and really align our fees with the probability of winning? So when we think about fees, fees sh- should reflect, one, the market rate for beta, the alpha potential of the asset class, and really solve for the overall probability of winning from an investor standpoint. And we want to change the alignment and really turn what's been the model for 40 years on its head. That's different for every asset class. Every asset class isn't created equal. Our approach probably will be slightly different for every asset class, but again, it's aligning with investors. It's standing with investors with shared risk, shared objectives, and changing the math, changing the probability. The goal is to change the probability of winning for active investors. In the Westwood White Paper, Mission Possible, you talk about the renaissance of active management. Tell us about that renaissance. We believe the shift back to active products is going to have to be led by fee reform and truly aligning with investors and truly aligning with 
the true value of active management. We see Westwood Sensible Fees as taking a major leap forward for the industry and really being a catalyst for investors and how they rethink active management. And hopefully it's a catalyst for the industry to begin innovating again to align with investors. And the second part of that, Rick, is really investors demand for alpha. And to generate alpha, a portfolio has to have distinct intent. It has to have a high active share and be materially different from the benchmark. I think investors today are far too sophisticated to look at a portfolio with high fixed fees as a closet index product and really give that asset manager a chance to win. Well, Phil and Harvey, thank you for a fascinating discussion today. And we look forward to seeing how you change the future for all of us moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. 